you, Wayne. And, and thank you, Pat, for, for having me. Uh, and congrats on another, another great year, another great conference. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. Um, a lot has happened since, uh, since Blue Origin, uh, at Blue Origin in the past year. And uh, that said, we're still relative newcomers to, to this conference and to the industry. So I want to remind you of, of where we've come from and, uh, and tell you where we are and we're going to give you a preview of where we're going today. Um, so Blue Origin, uh, at Blue Origin, we imagine a future where, where millions of people are living and working in space and, and not uh, from countries around the world. Um, and not just astronauts from these government space programs, but, but ordinary people like you and me. So uh, um, that is a very exciting future for me and, and, and I hope for all of the rest of you. Um, let's go ahead and... The New Shepard space vehicle is designed to carry six people um, from beyond 100 kilometers, which is the inter internationally recognized boundary of space. And once there, they will experience the thrill of weightlessness and breathtaking views of Earth outside of the largest windows to ever fly into space. Uh, but New Shepard is, is no ordinary rocket. Um, as far as I can remember, rockets have been flying to space um, longer than I can remember, for over 60 years. Uh, and they've always just flown one way. They, they take their payload up to um, orbit and they're expended, uh, thrown out in the ocean, and uh, they're only used one time. And so um, this is what we've come to know and expect. And, and I want you to know that it's not anymore. Not anymore. We're, we're changing that. So in November of last year, just less than one year ago since I was at this conference, uh, a New Shepard rocket launched into the air on its second mission, just three hours away from here. Uh, the rocket rose smoothly, and observers who were able to watch it um, until engine cutoff at about 60 kilometers. Um, out of sight, the capsule separated from the booster and both vehicles coasted to independent apogees over 100 kilometers. The, uh, and this is the view you would have seen out the window if you were on that vehicle. Minutes later, uh, onlookers reacquired sight of that powerless booster high in the sky as it was uh, on its 100 kilometer free fall back to Earth. Uh, as it plunged to the ground, and just as it appeared that it was certainly crashed into the desert floor, uh, a bright flash below the ship um, ignited signaling that our BE-3 rocket engine had, had started back up exactly was, as it was designed. So within seconds, we saw the descent rate um, arrest, and the rocket entered its slow and deliberate descent back down to the landing pad. The landing legs deployed, and the rocket disappeared in a cloud of dust. So we all waited. Um, it remained hidden for what appeared like an eternity, but was really several seconds until the breeze scattered that dust cloud out of the way and we could see that rocket with its landing gear straddling the center of the pad. A perfect, perfect landing. And that's what it looked like. Minutes later, the capsule came down um, and made a slow descent uh, to the ground safely under its parachutes. And uh, the reaction on the ground was euphoric. Um, it's that incredible electric atmosphere that, that only comes when you know you've done something monumental, you've done something historic. And it was a beautiful, beautiful flight. Um, the rocket landing was a sight to behold, uh, and hitting the center of that pad is really no small feat. And I wanted to talk to you about today about what that meant to us. Um, now last week, we conducted another launch. Uh, since that historic flight in November, we've conducted, we've actually reused this exact same vehicle five times, including last week's in-flight escape test. And the plan here was to intentionally command escape at about 45 seconds uh, after liftoff and about 16,000 feet uh, mean sea level. Um, a redundant separation system uh, was to sever the crew capsule just as our solid rocket motor escape system ignited, separating the two stages. Uh, that solid rocket motor uh, uh, is 70,000 pounds of thrust. Um, the escape motor uh, vector would actually steer the capsule slightly away from the booster um, out of the booster's path to safety uh, before releasing its drogue and then main parachutes and coming down, um, slowly down to the ground. Now, now we were really optimistic about the crew capsule's performance. Um, we felt very, very good about it. We had tested this uh, system in a pad escape test back in October of 2012. Uh, but the booster, on the other hand, um, was we were really certain, pretty certain we were going to lose it. Um, it had never been designed for this kind of an environment. Um, uh, to survive an in-flight escape, and so why would it? You know, in theory, 
you would only escape, you would only trigger an escape if you had a problem with the booster, you know, that, that caused you to either steer off course or some other, other types of things. And, and in that case, you'd want to get away from the booster as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, this was, however, you know, we're humans and we're emotional. This was our historic booster that we'd flown um, many times before, four times before, and it's the only reusable rocket in spaceflight history. So despite knowing the odds were that this booster would go out with a bang on the desert floor, we wanted to give it a proper retirement party. And so therefore, in hopes of landing it, um, following that in-flight escape, we did some analysis. Uh, we made some software and hardware modifications to the vehicle. And, and honestly, we, we crossed our fingers. And uh, the result of the test, let's take a look. So. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the live stream of today's Blue Origin test flight. So everything seems nominal for an exhilarating test flight. Today's mission is totally focused on a successful crew capsule escape with the understanding that the booster will likely be lost. It's time to hand this show over to Mission Control so we can listen in on the final countdown. I, I, I'm super excited to see this thing go. Godspeed, New Shepard. Five, <laughs> four, command start, two, one. Shepard has cleared the tower. There you have it, a spectacular launch of New Shepard, live from West Texas. Right, coming up here around 44, 45 seconds is when we'll see our escape. There it is, 70,000 pounds of thrust pushing that crew capsule. And the B3 engine remains on, the booster continues to space. The drogues are out on the crew capsule. There go the mains. Okay, so those three mains are reefed right now to keep them small. The reefing will remove shortly to fully expand, as you can see. And touchdown of the new Shepard crew capsule. From what we can tell, that was a nominal in-flight test of our escape system. And again, all astronauts on board would have had a pretty exhilarating ride, but a safe ride. The BE-3 will restart, and we'll wait for that smooth, gentle descent onto the pad. There she goes. Look at that. Nice and stable. Landing gear deploying. There you go. The booster's in the tail of the wire. It's got Set the shot. Beautiful. Wow. There it is. Touchdown. <laughs> what an extraordinary test and a tremendous final flight for both craft. If you're interested in learning more and keeping up to date on our progress, be sure and sign up on our website for email updates. And until our next exciting launch, Gradatum Ferocitor. Thank you, Aria. <laughs> well, that was a, a picture perfect test. Um, and I, I want to point out our objective, our test objective was to do the in-flight escape and recover that crew capsule. So getting the booster back was, was gravy and uh, we're excited to get it back. But, uh, but the fact that we, we can demonstrate an in-flight escape, that's a test that hasn't been conducted since, since the Apollo program. Uh, very, very important in our human flight test program. So, so despite the abuse of the 70,000 pounds of thrust um, blasting it, the booster barely budged off course. Um, as it punched its way towards space and then came back and landed on the pad. Um, I want to show you a dramatically um, slowed down version. There it is in the plume. Um, I want to show you a dramatically slowed down video of just the separation event so you can, just, you can see just how steady that booster is. So let's go ahead and, oops, there it is. Now the, the booster is completely engulfed in the plume right now. And wait for it. It's still there. <laughs> there it is.
Okay. So there's, there's many things that this is useful for. And uh, um, sorry, I skipped a, if you can go back one chart after the video. Um, conducting an in-flight escape, of course, is useful to demonstrate the, 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 um, the operations of that escape system. It's also useful for us to, to uh, demonstrate our models of separation for two and three stage vehicles. Um, um, and it's also useful because the, the new Shepard system is the lowest cost way to test our escape system. So if we decide later that we need to do this test over and over again, this is the lowest cost way to do it. And the fact that we can recover that booster to use again is a, is a very important point. So um, at Blue Origin, we aim for precision and robustness in our design and execution. And last Wednesday's test uh, certainly epitomized it. Um, words can't describe the pride that I have in our, in our system and our team. Uh, I just couldn't be more proud. Um, this test got us one step closer to human spaceflight, and we're still on track for fl to flying people. Um, our test astronauts by the end of 2017, and then uh, starting commercial flights in 2018. Um, and in the interim, we're already flying um, research payloads uh, and education payloads as well. And as a matter of fact, uh, we're proud, proud par uh, participants in NASA's Flight Opportunities Program. Um, and I'd like you to all uh, uh, consider flying payloads on New Shepard because it's a very unique platform um, that, that will give you uh, the three to four minutes of weightlessness. When uh, Jeff Bezos founded Blue Origin, this momentous mission, uh, landing a rocket back from space, was always envisioned as one step um, in a long journey to seed an enduring human presence in space. And when that vision becomes a reality, <clears throat> we will look back on this blue planet Earth and consider it our origin, uh, not the origin of one agency or one country. Earth is our blue origin, all of us. Um, we at Blue Origin are dedicated to the make that, making that vision our shared and global reality. There are many things that have to happen to turn that dream into reality, but the first and foremost is to dr dramatically lower the cost and increase the safety of getting people and goods into space. Um, that's the basic foundational building block of a new space economy, and that's what we at Blue Origin are dedicated to doing. While New Shepard makes it look easy, I can assure you that landing a rocket coming back from space is not easy. Um, there are significant technical challenges that need to be overcome. The first of these challenges relates to engine thrust, and our BE3 engine has performed flawlessly throughout the program. The liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen BE3 engine is the first of its kind to be developed in the US in 15 years. <coughs> And it's also the first tap-off cycle engine to, be ever, uh, to ever be developed and flown. Uh, it can continuously throttle from its top end thrust of 110,000 pounds down to 20,000 pounds uh, to enable precise uh, controlled vertical landings. The engine has to balance its duties of decelerating the booster while simultaneously keeping it upright and guiding it to a small landing pad and doing it as propellant levels quickly approach zero. There are really significant um, aerodynamic and control challenges as well, as the rocket must be capable of flying both, both up um, and down while managing a constantly moving center of gravity and center of pressure during descent. Individually, these are, you know, these are no small tasks, but taken together, it represents a huge challenge to engineering design. The, the reason we're doing New Shepard is to practice. We humans get really good at things that we practice. And, uh, and if you need a surgery, you, you want to go to the surgeon that does, does a surgery 10 times a week or, or even 10 times a day, not the surgeon that does it 10 times a year. Um, with New Shepard, we can fly hundreds of times and get really good at launching and landing this cryogenic reusable first stage, whereas with an orbital launch vehicle, it would take the flight rates far lower, so it would take us much, much longer. Now, along with the continued operations of New Shepard, uh, we're building an even larger rocket uh, to take astronauts to orbital destinations, and we call it New Glenn. Uh, the first stage is powered by seven BE-4 rocket engines, which, and it will be reusable, uh, and it'll land vertically, just as our New Shepard system. Uh, New Glenn is designed for human spaceflight, but it will also be capable of taking satellites and spacecraft to low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit. Now, New Glenn is the smallest um, orbital launch vehicle we're ever going to build, but 
This is actually the smallest vehicle we'll ever build. This is a wind tunnel model of New Glenn in a recently completed wind tunnel test series uh, where we um, developed a New Glenn aerodynamic database and validated our computational fluid dynamics results, uh, excellent results. We know that we're going to be building larger and larger vehicles as we move on towards our vision of millions of people living and working in space. And in fact, we, uh, on the drawing board, we already have an, the next vehicle we call New Armstrong. Now, now, people have asked us since this announcement about a month ago, why such a big rocket? And, and the answer is simple. If you're going to have millions of people living and working in space, you need launch capacity to create and sustain that, that, that launch economy. So that is why we're, we're building New, New Glenn. Where's this next chapter it, uh, it's going to start? It's going to start in Florida. We've taken over Launch Complex 36 uh, at Cape Canaveral in Florida. And we're building uh, these, these launch vehicle stages right across the street, um, just outside the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we broke ground in May of this year. And, and construction is progressing quickly. And in fact, today, we, we um, installed the very first vertical, vertical beam on our, our manufacturing facility. So we're very excited to start going vertical in that in that site because all the work to date has been underground and site work. Um, I'm also happy to report that following Hurricane Matthew, our team is safe. There's no significant damage at the site. And in fact, the crews were back to work on Monday morning. So we're very, very excited about that and very, very pleased uh, that, our, that our Florida team um, was able to avoid any, any impact to their lives. So what's going to power New Glenn? Um, this large rocket engine we call the BE-4. The BE-4 burns liquefied natural gas, and it's going to produce 550,000 pounds of thrust. We'll have seven of these on New Glenn, um, and we're well over halfway through the BE-4 development program with hundreds of tests conducted uh, on the pre-burner, the turbo machinery, the main injector, and all the control valves. Um, we're now developing the transient, transient start, start sequence, and we're making really great progress um, and uh, excited about how that's coming and plan to be conducting uh, engine testing uh, in early next year. The BE-4 is the same engine that will power the Vulcan launch vehicle that's being developed by United Launch Alliance. Uh, and uh, Vulcan will debut later this decade and will launch payloads to, to um, orbit and beyond. We're also proud to be a member of the orbital ATK team providing the BE-3U uh, high energy upper stage engine for their next generation launch vehicle. Uh, the BE-3U is a, a variant of the same BE-3 engine that we're using to fly New Shepard uh, for both launch and landing. Uh, Blue Origin has become the supplier of choice uh, to premier launch providers, and I think that's a testament to the investment uh, that's been made in our engine line over the last uh, 10 years. So, so here's the BE-4 in manufacturing. At Blue Origin, we're taking advantage of the fact that we're coming of age in this era of high-performance high computing and advanced manufacturing. We've made significant investments in bringing 3D printing, automation, and, and laser-wielding robots into our factory uh, so that we can control critical processes in-house. Uh, while we are highly vertically integrated, we are partnered with some very, very important suppliers to add speed and flexibility to our development. Uh, and we're all in on adopting these new approaches that take full advantage of modern tools, and the BE-4 takes this to a whole new level. The regeneratively cooled nozzle that you see in this image um, takes advantage of all of our advanced manufacturing capabilities. Um, additive manufacturing has allowed us to dramatically uh, accelerate our development pace. And if I look back to New Shepard, um, that New Shepard rocket has over 400 additively manufactured uh, parts on, on the booster and capsule. Now, here's the Gox dome, the gaseous oxygen dome. Um, this is a part that we've manufactured both using traditional methods, casting, and also with additive manufacturing. Uh, the unit here was cast, um, and it took nearly a year to produce. Uh, by comparison, an additively manufactured Gox dome uh, took less than three months to produce, and we believe it, it to be the largest additively manufactured part ever made. This is our test stand for BE-4, um, and it's very important that we have our own test capabilities at Blue Origin. This is about three hours away in West Texas. Um, pairing our manufacturing technology with uh, the advanced computing and a hardware-rich testing facility is, uh, is allowing us to rapidly advance our understanding of our engine designs. Testing in these facilities, like this one, allows us to move significantly faster. In fact, we're able to test five times faster in our own facilities, conducting multiple tests every day. Uh, last year, in the year 2015, we conducted over 550 engine tests at our West Texas site, 
between our BE3 and our BE4 programs. That's an average of well over one engine test per day. So New Shepard is just the beginning. Uh, we've got big plans, and to fulfill those plans, we need to grow and we need lots of talented people. Since I was here last year, we've doubled in size from 400 to 800 people, um, and we're continuing to grow uh, uh, in the company. I'm currently adding hundreds of jobs to our already incredible team across engineering, uh, finance and business operations, uh, and manufacturing. And if you want to get updates on all the cool work that we're doing, um, I encourage you to sign up on our website for email updates at, uh, at blueorigin.com. And uh, at, at Blue Origin, our motto is Gradatum Ferociter, which means step-by-step -step ferociously. So please stay tuned. There's a lot more to come. Thank you very much. Wow, Rob, let me just say how impressive. We have a number of questions from the audience here. If we got a few minutes, you've kindly agreed to take questions. And let me start off with what I think is uh, one you'll appreciate, technical question. What were the G-forces the crew would have experienced during that abort? So during that abort, it's about, it's about 10 Gs. The, uh, we've done all the analysis of the results in our one-day quick look. Today's the seventh day since the flight, so our seven-day report's going on now, or yesterday was. Uh, but everything, everything looked fine. Everything was well within our human tolerances, so we're excited about that. Super. And, and uh, folks were asking, who made your abort motor, the solid rocket motor? Uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. Yep. Very good. Yep. Okay. Uh, there are a number of questions regarding reuse. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, there's a debate in the community about reuse. Mm -hmm. um, what's your cost of recovery, refurb, requalification compared with building a new propulsion module? Oh, How does gosh. that compare? It doesn't even compare. I mean, we're, we're talking about um, hundreds of hours, tens of thousands of dollars in materials to recover, uh, to recover um, and refurbish this booster. Now, it is a suborbital booster, but, uh, but all first stage boosters are suborbital. Um, the TPS, uh, the thermal protection system refurbishment is sort of our highest number, but it's uh, it really is, it's, it's a, got a blade of elements in it, and so we knew that that was going to be the case. It's, okay. it's very low cost. How many, uh, how many reuses uh, are planned for, for a propulsion module? So we've designed the system for 25 uses, this first um, iteration. We expect to um, increase that design life um, over time for future versions of the booster, but, but understand that all comes down to are the loads and the environments that we designed it to, do they match? Or do they match what we're seeing in flight? And so we're doing that with five flights under our belt. We can start trending and looking at, looking at that family of data and seeing if, if the life of this booster is going to be the same, shorter, or longer. So, uh, but this booster is not going to fly again. And it's, what are you yeah. going to do with that booster? <laughs> this, this booster is going to come up to Kent. Uh, we're going to complete all our inspections. Uh, and then it's going to go to a museum. Which museum is to be determined? Uh, and Jeff Bezos will make that decision. But, uh, but we're, we're going to start thinking about that shortly. So. Okay. We're excited about that. Okay, let me see. I, I got so many questions here and we're about to run out of time. Okay. Um, what uh, features backup systems for depressed contingencies exist to give confidence in the decision not to use pressure suits? So first off, it's a short duration mission. We have a life support system on board, humidity control, um, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a test um, it's a design and test criteria that we set. You know, it starts from the beginning. So, uh, and that was a, a requirement going in. Um, we, we're still going through, th this capsule I'll point out, you know, doesn't have all those life support systems on board. This, this, is, our, this is our prototype that we've flown, you know, seven times now, that capsule, um, going back to pad escape. But uh, as we're building, we're building in the windows, hatch, seats, and life support system now, and, and those are all part of that, the design requirements for that. Super. Yeah. And one last question, because we're uh, there, I got a lot of questions, but we're going to be out of time. Okay. When will the first uh, full-scale engine test for the BE4 occur? It'll it'll occur early in, in next year, early 2017. Outstanding. So, well, yeah. best of luck. Thank you, Rob, for being here, bringing us up today. Thank you, man. Great. Yeah.